Like we need local at home, decentralized, sustainable agriculture, food production, which Ryan is veggies and meat, veggies and meat. <laughs> I have opinions on this thing. All right. David doing a nutrition podcast is just about the most bear market thing I can think <laughs> of right now. Hey, Bankless Nation, it is time for the weekly roll up. Happy third week of July. I hope you have your morning coffee. David, you drinking a morning coffee? Oh, two, two every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Just we, two? we never miss it. No carbs in coffee, right? Oh, absolutely not. Black, black coffee. As soon as you put <laughs> anything into coffee, sugar, milk, anything, it becomes a beverage. It's no longer oh, coffee. Wow, dude. These, these takes. Ma- some, these uh, maxi takes. <laughs> yeah, anti-carb maximalism here. I don't know if we're going to stand for it. We're not talking nutrition today, though. I know you want to start another podcast, but the topics of the week are crypto. David, what are we going to cover on the roll-up today? Celsius files for bankruptcy after paying off its DeFi loans. Important, very important order of operations there. So we're gonna cover that. Uh, Suzu of Three Arrows Capital leaks the StarkNet token, and then the next day, StarkNet announces a token. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> go figure. Uh, Thanks, so Sue. We're gonna cover, gave uh, something. cover all of that, both like why he leaked the StarkNet token uh, and all the, the StarkNet token details. Also, Vitalik writing a book coming out on Amazon called Proof of Stake. Uh, do you have it pre-ordered, Ryan? I, I did pre-order yeah. that, yeah, just yeah. last week. And then Ave doing a stablecoin, GHO for Ghost, the Go stablecoin. Cool. A lot, cool. lot, lot happening in crypto, of course. We're going to talk about markets in just a second. And of course, if you like the roll-up, if you like the Bankless podcast, mm-hmm. if you appreciate what we are doing here, if you want to spread the word, make sure you like and subscribe. Give us a review mm-hmm. if you are viewing this pod, listening yeah. to this podcast in your podcast player too, Spotify, Apple, if you will. This comes out every Friday, of course. Also, something also, new on Spotify. We actually have video on Spotify now. Uh, right. Yeah. I was just going to say that. Yeah. So, if, so if, if you are on Spotify and you also want to see mine and Ryan's faces, that option is available to you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I actually started seeing that on the Lex Friedman podcast. It was yeah. the first time on Spotify I saw Spotify video, and I kind of like it. It gives us another avenue for right. distribution of the video beyond uh, YouTube, yeah. so we get some redundancy there. That, uh, YouTube is the only place that we have our video. Well, not anymore because of Spotify, but it's kind of crazy to think about. Like, oh, well, there's, we, we put out the podcast everywhere, but like YouTube's only the only place that gets the video. Uh, and do under, you remember that now. one time YouTube uh, yeah. kicked our channel off? Yeah. Do you remember like that one time hours? the YouTube CEO apologized for kicking us off YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool. Can't believe that happened. That was this year, right? It was Did that this happen year. this year? Yeah. It's all a blur. <laughs> Wasn't that Whatever, long ago? <laughs> one thing you need to do, though, is go check out Juno. Juno is sponsoring this message. I really like what Juno is doing. Mm-hmm. This is a crypto native bank account. Of course, I have a bank account, David. Yeah. Like full confession, mm-hmm. I know you do too. Yeah. We have to. We have fiat bills yeah. that we have to pay. My but my bank account is ether, crappy. Sadly, not that I would. Pay yeah, sadly, maybe someday. Yeah. But um, my bank account, I bank at Wells Fargo. Like true story, mm-hmm. it sucks. I can't do anything right. in crypto inside of my fiat bank account, and that is why, if you have a bank account, you also need a crypto native bank account. What features does Juno bring to the table, David? Yeah. So. Uh, your Juno checking account can turn into your token on Polygon in like one click, five, five minutes or less. Uh, and so like, you know, my, my world also bank at Wells Fargo. That's why we pick on Wells Fargo all the time. It goes from Wells Fargo to my Gemini to swap to Ether to then into my like crypto wallet. On Juno, it goes from your checking account to Ether on your preferred layer two of choice, uh, Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum, uh, ZK Sync, and Starkware coming soon uh, in, in one click, right? And so we're just cutting out like t- like 30 minutes and like 17 button presses. And you probably have to reset your password anyways. Uh, and so that that's all, like super awesome. Like checking account to layer two, crazy. Uh, 6% on your USDC if you want that. That's an opt-in thing. Uh, 3% on B- Bitcoin and Ether. Uh, but then if also if you sign up, if you get a direct deposit, which also can be turned into crypto. So you go from your employer cha- paycheck to crypto to a layer two all inside of one app, which is awesome. Uh, but that, that direct deposit gets turned into crypto. Uh, and if you sign up and get your direct deposit, they will pay you $100. And if you deposit crypto on the crypto side, they'll pay you $10. So there is a link in the show notes to sign up for Anjuno. Uh, this is the new era of banks. We're going to have banks for a while, sadly. Um, but we do <laughs> want the good ones to have cool crypto native features that allows you to leave your bank easier if you so choose. 
another step to going bankless. Mm -hmm. uh, click the link in the show notes. That's uh, bankless.cc slash Juno to find that out. David, let's get to markets. Yeah. What's Bitcoin doing this week, my friend? Yeah, Bitcoin a little bit down on the week. Start of the week at $20,400. Oh, it's gone up since I wrote down these prices. Crazy. Okay, so <laughs> crypto markets, they move. Go Not figure. that much, though. <laughs> Not that much. Don't get too excited. Yeah. Uh, so down from 20,400 20, up to uh, down to 20,150. So like down 1%-ish, one percent ish one and a half percent and how about ETH? Ether started the week at 11.85, currently at 11.15, so down about what is that? I have to redo these numbers because, like, when I wrote these numbers, it was 10.80, not 11.115. Uh, uh, so, like, rough six percent down, six percent. Call it quick math. Yeah. As of now, as of now, yes. when you listen to this yeah, on Friday morning, matter. it'll, it be, it'll be completely different. So none of what David said actually matters. Why do matters we even do this? Thing. I don't know. Why do we even tell you price? You know, it's just going to change. <laughs> but we're looking at trends over time, David, and the trend mm -hmm. is down mm -hmm. bad. But but there's also some interesting inflation news, mm -hmm. and um, crypto is not responding as negatively mm -hmm. to that yeah. recent inflation news as it could have. Right. So maybe maybe there's a silver lining there. We'll get to some of that later. But what about the ratio, David? Ratio flat ratio. on the week. Flat on the week. It's flat. Point zero five e five. It's not telling us anything. It's not telling, telling us, us everything. Market doesn't know what to do right now. Uh, global cryptocurrency total market cap. We are under a trillion dollars. Yes. What are we headed at today? Yeah, last, last week we were up to 976 billion. This week we're down to 929 billion. The good news is we get to uh, celebrate that one trillion yet again and mm -hmm. probably again, get back down and again and again and again. And again. And again. <laughs> 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 Repeat. What is the point of looking at any of these prices? <laughs> How about uh, Ethereum gas prices? Uh, not doing too bad there. I mean, they're down as yeah, well. Yeah. So if you're trying to get a transaction through, it's a okay. good time to do that. DeFi is, what are we DeFi looking is at? cheap right now. Um, I think the, the average grade price in the last week was like 20 something. You doing anything new? In uh, on Ethereum, it's like all the cheap, no. all the cheap gas no, transactions. I'm not doing too much. No, well, no, and that, that's reflected people. in like the usage charts. Like the usage charts right. are generally down. Except you know, I, I was looking at the usage charts. You know, the usage chart that's actually up uh, in terms of like usage and volume. US, uh, USDC, yeah, stable, stable coins. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say the transactions I actually did on Ethereum this week were all like withdrawals and deposits and right. like stable coin stuff. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, it's nice. I only have to pay like a dollar for that. Right, right. Usually it's like mm -hmm. five, Ridiculous, six, yeah. mm -hmm. something like this. Um, all right, well, let's talk about the big macro story, which continues to be inflation. And David, new numbers came mm -hmm. in this week and they were the worst in mm -hmm. 41 years. They were higher than US, last month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, US inflation just hit a four-decade high of 9.1%. That is the headline in the Wall Street Journal. Um, we should break this down a little bit, but first, first here's the chart. Um, look how bad it is. 9.1%. Yeah. Wow. Inflation just shooting up like a rocket in uh, 2022. Uh, and then from a category perspective, what are the big contributing categories, David? Yeah. Energy is obviously the big one. So the, the biggest ones are fuel oil in the last year has doubled. Gasoline has gone up 60%. Gas utilities up 38%. Electricity up 14%. So like those are the biggest ones and they're all energy related. The next one after that is food, like groceries, up 12%, which is also a proxy of energy. Uh, and then new cars is like the first non-food, non-energy one, which is up, up 12%. Overall CPI up 9.1%. Uh, I heard this really awesome uh, illustration for like energy. Uh, like why why is, why do people pay attention to energy like so much in the glo uh, global macro space? Uh, energy is like nature's interest rate. It is the cost of doing things. If you need to move yourself any further than where you can walk, you have to consume energy. Elevators take energy. Escalators take energy. Cars energy. Trains energy. Buses planes. Like those things also move all of the things that people need. Like like food. Uh, and so when, ener when energy prices goes up, like the cost of existing also goes up, which makes the world a harder place to exist in as it goes in. So this is why everyone's concerned. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like a transaction fee for real life, right? Yes. yes. I, I guess th that's why they call it gas on Ethereum. It is really <laughs> yeah. the analog. If you want to do anything right. in the metaverse on Ethereum, you have to pay gas. Right. If you want to do anything in real life, it's going to come at you through the price of energy and fuel uh, costs. Um, David, we are also looking at the DXY, mm -hmm. which is... This is basically U.S. dollars, um, the ratio of U.S. dollars to, to w primarily the yen, mm -hmm. Japanese yen, and the I euro. It's the euro. Yeah. I think uh, it's the, both I of think those. the euro is the dominant one. But just a, it's a basket dominant of currencies. One. I think the euro is the biggest one, followed by the yen. 
And what's the story with the DXY? What's it doing? Yeah, we are hitting like a, also a very, very long time high, all time high in for, for a while. I think like the, the last time it was this high was something like 2001 or 2002 or something. 109 is the index. Uh, for, for record, uh, let's see, in, in the most recent it's high was like 102 back in like 2017, also when they were like raising interest rates most recently. Uh, but then COVID hit and it dumped. When the dollar's high, everything else is low uh, by comparison. Uh, and so like you, when you see this dollar index, you're like, and you're seeing that go through the moon, like all assets have suffered because that's the dollar going up versus, well, not, not all assets is a basket of currencies, but like strength in the dollar, right? A lot of like everyone's going to, uh, to France for ECC in a little bit, my, myself included. And all of a sudden, like my fiat, my fiat dollars it's are going to buy me some extra well, breakfast, you know? Did you see, David, uh, euros and the dollar are at parity? Uh, it's they both broke down below parity. It's like 90, below parity? Yeah, one euro is uh, one dollar. 99, wait, one dollar, one dollar and one cent is now one euro. No, wait, the inverse. Damn it, I'm so bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's, the dollar's okay. stronger than the euro. <laughs> yes, uh, but in the, that was like, so earlier in the week I made the joke that Circle's just releasing a new uh, stable coin. Mm -hmm. uh, the euro stable coin is called USDC. <laughs> <laughs> ha, kind of funny. <laughs> kind of funny. But also like, yeah. I mean, if you're European holding euros, not that funny. Yeah. Uh, and um, it's, I don't know how long this is going to persist for, but mm. our episode coming out with Luke Grauman is fantastic for answering this question yeah. about dollar strength and why it is strong. Doing a lot of macro content yeah, recently, puns. I've really been enjoying yeah. and learning a lot. But how did the market learned. react? Yes, so do I. How did the market react to all of this? Yes. You've got a meme for us. Yeah, I, I thought this was a great tweet. Uh, so Northman Trader, good Twitter account, says, today markets sold off on a hot CPI print, right? Because if CPI is high, that means like, oh, no, like the Fed's going to raise interest rates scary. That means like, you know, risk on assets is going to get pummeled, pummeled even more. So Northman Trader says, market, total, today markets sold off on a hot CPI print as it implies more aggressive rate hikes by the Fed. But then stocks rallied, realizing that this would result in a recession sooner, implying rate cuts earlier than expected before dropping again, realizing that a recession would come first. Basically, like, hello, volatility. Hello, uncertainty. We don't know what happens next. And just like people are confused. <laughs> Hello, this face yeah. is this the face that investors should podcast be Podcast listeners don't have to look at that face of that dog. <laughs> uh, you, but you should. You, this is why you should watch on uh, Spotify right now. Um, this is, um, you know, a question I've said mm -hmm. that I've had in the roll-up for the last few, few, uh, couple of weeks about macro markets. <coughs> well, I feel like I finally got my answer. Yeah. The question was, I was mystified why some people in macro are saying the Fed should just raise rates to 4 to 5%. Like, we need that immediately. And other people are saying, no, if the Fed raises to 4 to 5%, like, it breaks everything. The mm -hmm. U.S. Mm -hmm. goes insolvent, can no longer pay its interest payments. I was trying to understand why there's a difference of opinion. Uh, and here's one thing I concluded in our episode with Lynn Alden, our episode with Luke Grauman, that things are different. They're much different than the 1970s and Paul Volcker, where we could just increase uh, interest rates. And the big difference is we are at the end of a long-term debt cycle. We have a massive amount of debt now in uh, you know uh, the modern nations, modern economy, the US, Europe, just Japan, China, all around the world. And so I tweet this out, we're at the end of a long-term debt cycle and the only way to deleverage is to hold interest rates below inflation for most of this decade. Inflation is not politically tenable, so Powell must play the idiot by pretending to fix inflation while simultaneously pursuing it. That actually might explain some of the actions of Powell, right? I thought that was a so, really good and very nuanced take. Well, well done. Well done. It was, it's, it, well, this is kind of what I gleaned from our Luke Rahman right. episode is just kind of everyone's like, what the hell? Does Powell not know what he's doing? Right. Maybe he knows what he's, he's doing. Dumb. Yeah. Maybe he has to play the role of an actor, play the role of an I idiot, because the only way out of this, when you have wartime uh, debt, like debt, debt right. um, levels, then you kind of get wartime inflation on the on the other side of this. And this is to Lynn Alden's point, very much like the the way the 1940s played out, right. where for that entire decade you had about six percent inflation, while interest rates were at zero percent. Mm -hmm. So the delta was 6%. In some years, you had 19%. That is basically the way out of this. 
and Lynn Alden said this too. She said, uh, what does the Fed know versus what does the Fed know and not aren't telling us? So exactly. this is just a game of game theory. As It's like, all right, what are we going to portray to the markets that we're going to do? And what do the markets think that we're going to do? And so it's just really, it's, just, it's a game of game theory between the markets and the Fed. Uh, and so, totally. like, how smart is the Fed? And, like, if they're just playing dumb, like, oh, yeah, we're going to raise interest rates as long as CPI goes higher, and then the CPI goes higher, and the market just crashes on the CPI, high CPI print, the game theory works in favor of the Fed. Like, it did the thing that they wanted to do without actually raising interest rates. Yeah, and they know the only way out is through high CPI. Right. So well, we, maybe we hope everyone that they just, know that. We don't actually know what they know, Ryan. Yeah. The, the other alternative is, is this. Uh, or Jerome Powell is, is an actual idiot and we're all screwed. That's, like, that's is, still I don't also know. A I'm actually <laughs> uncertain, which is true. I guess we get to find out. Man, the 2020s are fun. Yeah, this is great. Um, game what's this game take, theory with all of our economic lives. Dimitri right. Kofrinius, we've had on the, on the podcast before. Uh, I, I also thought that was a, gave a really useful take. He says, I've been saying this for months, the Federal Reserve exists within a political system, and that system is currently fighting a proxy war with Russia and increasingly China. Policymakers are aware of that. A rising dollar creates leverage in that war. When you are a current uh, a nation state with a currency, and that currency is strong, you have more ammo to shoot with. As in, when you print money, and that money is stronger, you can do more things with that money. Uh, and so I, I thought this was a really good take. Like, we need a, a high dollar so that we can fight our, our, our actual kinetic war with Russia as a proxy uh, and then our economic war with China. So a rising dollar is, like, in the is interest of, like, the incumbent political establishment of the United States. Do you know, David, I just realized we need to do a, an episode on this, macro episode, the weaponization of the dollar. Mm. I, I want to I mm. dive into this uh, in more depth. I mean, so. I, I was just thinking I have Dimitri back on. I'm sure he would. He would. Well, he's, he says he's going to do this. So, so maybe we'll let him do this, and then we'll just invite him on, and he can tell us what he learned. He, he does the hard work, yeah. and, we, and then we snatch it from exactly. him. Thanks, Dimitri. Love you, man. Yeah. Um, what else, David, as we're talking about inflation? Mm -hmm. Do you know, um, just do, run some of the math here, right, on, on like gains. You're think about your portfolio, where to store your value. Uh, of course, if you have it in a savings account, a dollar in a savings account, it goes down 9% every year. Terrible place to hold value. So what do you do? Do you invest it? Well, everything's going down, so you got to be careful of the asset class. But Ryan Peterson makes this point. With a 9.1% inflation, if your portfolio makes less than 12% per year, the IRS takes 100% of your real dollar returns. <laughs> The tax optimizer is yeah. here to remind you. <laughs> well. There's still taxes too. <laughs> and so even a 12% return, you're actually making zero right. in terms of real returns. Nominal returns maybe, but zero in terms of real returns because you got to pay 30% of that right. at least to the IRS. Yeah. So where does anyone make money? less than 12% this year. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's probably the negative. Yeah. Well, that means you don't have to pay any taxes, David. <laughs> There's your silver lining. <laughs> you can't pay tax if you aren't making money. Here's Arthur Hayes, and he says, must watch the JPY and the euro, the Japanese yen and the euro. Expect an, quote, intervention to weaken if the USD, uh, to weaken the USD if Japan is greater than 150 and the euro is greater than 90 cents on the dollar. Intervention means mo Fed money printing. Printing money means Bitcoin number go up. The situation is fluid. So this is what I'm seeing more and more. And more is more people are seeing like there's a there's a path forward that seems not implausible where like the money printer gets turned on again. Yeah, I think, and this is also to pump our Luke Raman episode on Monday. Go listen to that episode. What he talks about is basically. A very likely way forward is that the Fed is going to start having to bail out mm -hmm. Japan and Europe, mm -hmm. its allies. Yeah. Do that in various ways by probably purchasing bonds. Mm -hmm. And so uh, watch out for that. And right. I guess that's good for crypto. Right. I don't know what it means for the rest of the world, but it's good for a scarce commodity asset. The, the take here is that in times like these, the economy is now like under the whim of politics. Like the the economy used to be a free market; it's no longer a free market. It's going to do the thing that like the the political institutions want it to do. Yeah, that which is exactly why we need to do more on geopolitics here, David, right. um, mm -hmm. to understand this. All right, uh, what's happening in the crypto world? Getting out of the inflation conversation. Yeah. This is a, a stat about miners. Yeah, new this? all time high set by uh, miners selling Bitcoin. A net of eighty eight thousand Bitcoins were sent to exchanges from miners. A new all time high. So I guess that doesn't mean actually sold miners just sold, sent it to an exchange. But like miners don't the buy the implication. Miners though. don't buy Bitcoin; they mint Bitcoin. Uh, and so a net all, a net out flow from miners to exchanges was hit at an all-time high yesterday. 
Why do you think this is happening? Are they just trying to cover costs? Yeah, yeah, they got to protect themselves from like further downside because like if Bitcoin goes down like another 50%, like a bunch of miners go underwater. So they also have to like hunker down for the winter. Like miners are a massively resource intensive right. um, kind of industry, right? It's like yes. all the energy yes. costs, but also all the hardware costs. Right. Um, what is uh, what does this take about treasury values yeah. of DeFi protocols? Yeah, so Hazu had a really good take on this a while ago where like treasuries that count their own native token as like their treasury, like you shouldn't be doing that because you can mint your token as much as you want anyway, so it doesn't really count. But some for some reason we do it. So anyways, uh, the treasury of Aave at the peak was $1.08 billion. Today it is $101 million. Uniswap at the peak, $4.8 billion. Now it's $1.3 billion. Index, peak, $105 million. Now it's $4 million. So Four like, million. Yeah, oof. Uh, so like these treasuries, which are held largely held in the native tokens, but other DeFi tokens as well, are all down bad. Uh, and so like this, Hazu was ringing the alarm about this. It's like you guys need to diversify your treasuries at the peak, not not at the bottom, uh, or else you'll be will be in trouble. Uh, and no one really seemed to have, to do that. No one really yeah, to do that. I think very few took his advice. But that's a great point. It's like uh, you know, if you look at Apple's balance sheet, and you're like, right. how much cash on hand do you have, Apple? They're not going to count all of the Apple, Apple shares, shares that right. they could potentially mint, right. or they might have in reserve somewhere. Right. We're going to tell you, you about get, like, like, I the have actual an money, infinity in the money treasury. <laughs> yeah. How much Bitcoin do you have? How much ETH do you have? How much mm -hmm. uh, stable coins do you right. have? That is your treasury right. if you're a DAO. And I think yeah. we're learning that lesson. Real money. Um, David, what is this? This is a kind of a the Lido mm -hmm. uh, liquid staking balance as compared to all of the other liquid ETH tokens out there, Li liquid ETH staking tokens out there. And what are we seeing here? Yeah, so the concern of Lido centralization has been uh, pretty big for a while. Uh, and you can see here, it's showing up here in the numbers. Uh, 4.1 million Ether is staked with Lido, which of the liquid staking services, the people that have uh, uh, like a, a liquid staking derivative, like Lido has staked ETH, Rocket Pool has our ETH. Lido's got 90.6% of that share. Uh, and so, like, the centralization of Lido is, like, an increasingly large concern. Uh, some people call it, like, the biggest centralization, the biggest uh, systemic risk to Ethereum since the DAO itself, uh, just because, like, network effects beget network effects. Like, uh, staked ETH is super liquid. It has the most integrations. Like, staked ETH is the most useful of staking derivatives. So there's a lot of centralization power that a lot of people are worried about. Yeah, I guess my take on this is, um, yes, I'm concerned, but it's not like it's not like a code red. Yeah. Well, like, you know, yellow, orange, like... I'm concerned, but I, I also think it's still very early. Yeah. Uh, the My other take here is something we've been saying a lot is the key to changing this is better competition, right. really. Right. right. We can't put other limitations on Lido. It's, it's home staking has to get better. Mm -hmm. Other liquid staking providers have to get uh, way better. And then lastly, I'll say, I don't think any of this is, is like permanent. No. I mean, we don't even have withdrawals yet, so it's still too early to see, but uh, it is something to pay attention to and it's important. Mm -hmm. I do think it's become very obvious. And David, I feel like this was obvious two years ago when, uh, or three years ago when we read that piece from um, Dan Elitzer yeah. on Superfluid Collateral yeah. that the killer app is liquid ETH staking. Right. Once you stake your ETH, there's an asset that's produced on the other side of that. People want to do things with that asset in DeFi. Right. That is the the marvel of tokenization. So uh, that is a killer app, and it, all the competitors need to figure out how to compete with Lido on that level in order to eat some of the market share and take that away from them. David, what, what do we have next? Coming up next, the big stories of the week. Of course, chapter, Celsius files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Three Arrows Capital leaks the StarkNet token. Starknet then later launches their token, not launches their token, announces their token. So we're going to get into all those details and, of course, the rest of the news right after we get through some of these fantastic sponsors that help you go bankless. Rocket Pool is your friendly, decentralized Ethereum staking protocol. You can stake your ETH with Rocket Pool and get our ETH in return, allowing you to stake your ETH and use it in DeFi at the same time. You can get 4% on your ETH by staking it with Rocket Pool, but you can get even more by running a node. Rocket Pool is the only staking provider that allows anyone to permissionlessly join their network of validating nodes. Running a Rocket Pool node is easier to set up than running a solo node, and you only need 16 ETH to get started. Why would you do this? You get an extra 15% staking commission on the pooled ETH, so your APY is boosted. So if you're bullish ETH staking, you can increase your APY and get some extra tokens by adding your node to the decentralized Rocket Pool network, which currently has over a thousand independent validators. It's yield farming, but with Ethereum nodes. You can get started at rocketpool.net and also join the Rocket Pool community in their Discord. You can find me hanging out there sometimes in the chat, so I'll see you there. 
MakerDAO is the OG DeFi protocol, the first DeFi protocol to ever exist, even before we called it DeFi. MakerDAO produces DAI, the industry's most battle-tested and resilient stablecoin. Using Maker, you don't need to sell your collateral if you need liquidity. Instead, you can spin up a Maker vault and use your collateral to mint DAI directly. With Maker, the power to mint new money is in your hands. And there's something new in the MakerDAO ecosystem. Every time a new MakerDAO is opened, the owner can claim a POAP, which contributes funds to One Tree Planted, an organization with ongoing global reforestation efforts, creating a world where digital participation and the health of our environment can live side by side. Soon, Maker will be present on all chains and layer twos, bringing the biggest and best DeFi credit facility to everywhere there is DeFi. So follow Maker on Twitter, at MakerDAO, and learn from the oldest and most resilient DAO in existence. All right, guys, we are back talking about Celsius. They have finally filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I know we've been talking about CeFi lenders a lot uh, and we can't seem to get away from them because new news develops every single week. What is this, David? Is this kind of mm -hmm. the nail in the coffin? Celsius is finally saying, we can't find an acquirer. There's no other way out. So legally, we have to go bankrupt. Right. Yeah, remember a number of people, I think Nexo took a look at, or maybe it was FTX, took a look at Celsius' balance sheets and in, in interested of them, in acquire, in, in, yeah, probably both of them, and interested in acquiring the thing. And then they were like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so like, uh, as a result of that, like, you know, the only option left you have is bankruptcy. So reading from the article here, today's filing follow, uh, follows the difficult but necess necess uh, necessary decision by Celsius last month to pause withdrawal swaps and transfers on its platform to stabilize its business and protect its customers without a pause, the acceleration of withdrawals would have allowed certain customers, those who were first to act, to be paid in full while leaving others to wait for Celsius to harvest value from illiquid or longer term asset deployment activities while they receive a recovery. Celsius says it has $160 million cash on hand, enough to support certain operations during the restructuring process. After paying off all of their DeFi loans in compound, Celsius announced that they had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy early Thursday morning after paying off their <laughs> DeFi loans. And so, wow. uh, so the users of this centralized app all have to sit on their hands while they wait for the dust to settle and they're gonna, probably going to take a haircut, including you, Ryan. Uh, all yes, of the users of, of, users of Compound or Aave or MakerDAO or all the, all the DeFi apps that Celsius used are being paid back in full because of the protections of the DeFi app protocol itself. That is my takeaway. What's your, what are your thoughts? I think that's I think that is the takeaway and that's mm -hmm. what we've seen this this week before they actually formally announced chapter 11 they paid off more than 800 million in debt mm -hmm. to DeFi apps mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool and they even unlocked their ST ETH they paid off their debt to to Aave right. as well DeFi so, apps paid in full Look man the take is this I tweeted this out notice that DeFi loans are the only ones insolvent CeFi companies are paying back right now the code is forcing them to pay back their loans, not laws, not attorneys, not co courts, code. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like DeFi works better, David. <laughs> Weird. That's why, the take. Why are we even here? <laughs> they couldn't, they had no alternative. They didn't have to go to court because they couldn't go to court because the rules of the collateral are written in right. code. The, the, Basically, the unless EDM you pay me is back. The court. Yes. Unless you pay back Ave, they're going to take all right. of your collateral. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's worth it to you to right. pay off. So you have to, right. like, it's incredible to me how well DeFi lending worked through this process. And I can't say enough. This is this is the bright spot mm -hmm. of everything that's gone on over the last, you know, two to three months, and certainly everything that's gone on with centralized lending uh, protocols. Right. Uh, there's a, also another part of this story. Uh, there's this account, 0xB1, that's famously part of the Celsius story. No one really knew who this account was. They just knew that they were doing stuff in DeFi, making a ton of money, and associated with Celsius. Uh, and now this, this uh, account tweeted out and revealed who they, who they are. So this account says, Hi, I'm Jason Stone. From August 2020 to April 2021, I led a group of talented individuals who managed the 0xB1 address. After discussions with Celsius in mid-2020, Celsius began an acquisition of Kefi, uh, a company that this uh, individual had founded. Uh, and thereafter, Kefi pivoted to staking and deploying DeFi strategies for Celsius. In August of 2020, 0xB1 was created, and uh, with other address addresses, Celsius would send customer deposits to us to manage. Shortly after, Celsius shared private keys to the address with us. Over the ensuing months, transferred hundreds of millions of dollars of customer deposits for us to invest. By the time Celsius and Kefi parted ways, we were managing nearly $2 billion of assets. 
Celsius' risk management platform monitored our investment strategies and performance using HedgeGuard and DBank. So basically, XeroXB1 would go and like yield farm, do strategies, make a bunch of money, and then Celsius would like see what they're up to with these apps. With uh, two billion in assets, two billion. by the way, depositor mm -hmm. assets. Mm -hmm. Celsius promised the Xerox B1 uh, team members that they assured us that as a part of this moderator, monitoring, their trading teams were active, adequately hedging any potential impermanent loss from our activities in liquidity pools. They assured me that they had risk management and hedging in place to account for fluctuations in token prices. But in late 2021, we discovered Celsius had lied to us. They had not been hedging our activities, nor had they been hedging the fluctuations in crypto asset prices. The entire company's portfolio had naked exposure to the market. So like when you're not supposed to, if you're taking customer deposits, you're not supposed to take that those like if they're USD deposits, right? You're not supposed to take those USD deposits and then buy ether with it in the hopes that ether goes up. That's opinionated. What you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to be doing delta neutral stuff that it doesn't matter what the prices of things do, you still get yield either way. They were taking opinion opinionated stances on the market with customers deposits which puts them in a position of potentially not making that money back. So, uh 0xv1 continues after seeing these and other major problems, problems in how the company operated. We informed Celsius that we wished to terminate our relationship. That was in March of 2021. Uh, we told Celsius that we would work with them to unwind our various positions over the following months. By April of 2021, however, because, I mean, bullish, bullish year, uh, bullish part of that year, uh, the value of assets under management had increased by another $800 million. But when we unwound the DeFi positions, Celsius, Celsius suffered impermanent loss. At first, they believed the impermanent loss was evidence of KeFi stealing and accused me of being a thief. It, they later to accept the impermanent loss for what it was, but we claimed I was responsible for it and completely ignored the fact that they had full visibility into all trading strategies deployed by KeFi and promised to hedge that exact risk. I have tried for over a year to quietly settle this dispute with Celsius pursuant to the contracts Celsius signed with KeyFi, they owe KeyFi a significant sum of money. We have been more than reasonable in attempting to resolve this with them. Uh, basically, it continues uh, to say that they have filed, a, a, they are suing uh, Celsius, uh, trying to get some money. Um, but yes, that's what Celsius did with your money. It's crazy how irresponsible that was. Just that yeah. story of like, they found someone who could manage money in DeFi protocols fairly well, mm -hmm. gave him $2 billion. When that fund and that individual said, this stuff I'm doing is kind of risky. Are you sure right. about this? And they're like, no, nah, we're he we're hedging the risk in other areas right. of the business. Which is which is totally fine. If they were doing that, that would have been like a risky but okay business. Like maybe they weren't right? doing that. Maybe. And then they come to find out they weren't even doing it. Right. So it's just all of the shady stuff behind right. the scenes. And it's so interesting because the user experience you have as a as a retail user is like deposit your funds here, get eight percent back. And the money right. comes in each month and you're like, oh, this sounds great. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, on the backside of this, I'm not going to say it was running like a Ponzi scheme, but risk management was woefully inadequate. Right. Uh, uh, and, absent. Um, it was absent. Absent. Completely absent. Yeah. Um, the question, I think, for people, including myself, who've deposited money into Celsius is, are we ever going to get our money back, David? What do you think the answer to that question is? Uh, I, yeah, I, not all of it. I think you will get... In the ballpark of a 50 percent haircut, you'll get you think so? That's your percent estimate? of your money back. I asked this question uh, from Twitter, and the the truth is, no one knows. It's going to chapter eleven, and uh, a bunch of the people were like, uh, "Yeah, no way, sorry, kiss it goodbye." Um, so people are being snarky. Yeah, you're definitely going to get it all, Ryan. <laughs> you will get something back. You're just uh, forced holding or some of the answers. So it seems like the sentiment is this is kind of a Mount Gox type situation. Uh, and uh, it's not looking good for right. getting your funds back. Maybe some portion of it at an unknown months, amount of time. Years down the line. Yeah. yeah. Um, After really the course unfortunate. Aside. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David. What do we got next? Yeah. Starkware token. What is this? Well, no, this is first off, we got to start with uh, Thrios Capital. Uh, so like Suzu breaks his silence on Twitter. And so he tweets out, sadly, uh, our good faith to cooperate with the li uh, liquidators has, was met with baiting. Hopefully they did exercise good faith with regard to Starkware token warrants. Basically, the lawyers never exercised Starkware token warrants. I'm not, this is like legal stuff that I'm not totally familiar with, but you have to like do a thing in order to get the tokens after you invest in Starkware, you got to do a thing. Uh, but the the lawyers didn't do that thing, uh, and uh, maybe maybe you know more about why they would have not have done this either out of neg negligence or probably uh, negligence. Yeah. They probably just missed it. It's kind of a technicality, and they didn't mm -hmm. they didn't check the box, right? Right. Um, anyways, 
this was released to Twitter, uh, and which was like the first news of a Starkware token, even though you everything, everything's going to have a token, so you know everything's going to have a token. Um, but this is like the first formal indication that we've seen of uh, Starkware having a token. Um, the other it's interesting, also Suzu's first tweet. And like forever, forever, first, right? first tweet since he's the, been on the land. Other, first tweet since that one that you can see right there. It's since June fourteenth, saying we are in process of communicating uh, with all relevant parties and intend to pay them fully back in full. Uh, also, not necessarily true, uh, evidenced by the fact that no one knows Ryan where Three Arrows Capital founders are. Uh, so where in the <laughs> where in the world are the Three Arrows Capital founders? Uh, people kind of as assume Dubai, but no one actually knows. Uh, Dubai being uh, a convenient place to not have an extradition treaty with basically the rest of the world. Um, but Suzu, Three, uh, Three Arrows Capital, Kyle Davies, uh, missing. Yeah, so I guess uh, things like this. On Friday, lawyers for Three Arrows Capital creditors, the people who want their money back, mm -hmm. claimed that uh, Suzu and, and Davies have not yet begun to cooperate in any meaningful manner, adding that the two kept their camera and audio off at an initial Zoom meeting. So you have the Zoom meeting and they're keeping their, their you know, camera and audio off. Like it's kind of a classroom during COVID and it's virtual school or something. They're just not like locking in. Um, so who knows where these guys are and what's going to happen next. Right. But um, that, that I guess, is the big alpha that we so, now so have a Starkware wait, token. Su Suzu uh, is selling his house uh, in Singapore, but he's only, he's looking for a buyer to wire him money to his Dubai bank account, which what? you know you can't you can't see his money in a Dubai bank account. That's like kind of the whole point. So he's got like this forty million dollar home that he's try, uh, trying to liquidate. I don't know if he's liquidating. Why isn't or not. he using crypto? It's not very crypto native of him. He's using the Dubai the banking has, system. Yeah, maybe. Well, yeah. Anyways, here's a picture of the Three Arrows Capital Capital office in Singapore uh, with some uncollected mail. Uh, there it is. Doesn't look very good. This is yeah. what uh, it looks like when a major hedge fund completely folds. Yeah. Um, NFT collection? Mm -hmm. We talked about that last week. This is still has to be liquidated, huh? Dave? Yeah, so this is the Starry Night Throws Capital's like, NFT fund, uh, which, I mean, they bought the top of the NFT mania, absolutely. Uh, but good taste. Good taste. Uh, people think that this Some is a really, really good collection. Uh, those are kid punks. Uh, oh, kid punks. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, I don't know about that one. That one's not Literatus. necessarily good taste. But yeah, there's a bunch of really cool stuff in here, which uh, oh. it's, it's all going to be liquidated. So if you are an NFT collector with a bunch of cash on hand, uh, you might have a field day soon. Yeah. Do, do, they, do they still exist? NFT collectors with cash on hand, David? Are there um, any left? Oh, with cash on hand? I don't know about yeah. that one. <laughs> Uh, all right, Starkware token. So what is the news then? It was like pre-released by mm -hmm. Three Arrows Capital mm -hmm. uh, and then more formally released by Starkware yeah. just days later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one day later. Yeah, exactly. So Starkware tweets out, uh, Starknet Alpha was launched on the Ethereum mainnet November 2021. Now is a, a time to advance its decentralization as demanded of an L2 on Ethereum. Here is our decentralization propo uh, proposal introducing the Starknet token and the Starknet foundation. Pretty much like playbook for decentralizing your layer two. Uh, and so they released three blog posts, uh, part one, part two, part three. Uh, and we're only going to read out parts of one and three. Uh, but the key points of, of uh, blog post number one says, Starknet's decentralization involves a native token and a new foundation. Again, par for the course. Uh, the Starknet token is used for governance and as the network's payment and staking asset. So that's actually, uh, I mean, not a crazy choice, but like demanding your own token to be the payment token for that particular layer two, that's an interesting choice to, to consider. Like that's not, that's like Arbitrum, Optimism, those don't, they don't do that. Uh, they take Ether as the gas for the layer two rather than the, pay, the network's native token. So they're, the take here is that like, well, if this Starkware's token is the new gas for the Starkware layer two, they're, they're like really more aligned with the Starkware layer two than they are with the Ethereum layer one. So it gets started to make its own like self-sovereign ecosystem. Uh, so there's that. Uh, 10 billion tokens have been minted and, and the allocation has begun. The Starkware Foundation now being set up will have a mission to maintain Starknet as a public good. We do like that public good word. So here are the details. 10 billion tokens. Uh, we'll pull up a pie chart here in a second. Uh, 17% going to Starkware investors, uh, three hours capital, which that's going to get liquidated and, and distributed, which, I mean, I'm kind of a fan of that because of decentralization. They had like a lot of it. Uh, and then 32.9% of uh, two core contributors. That is the Starkware team. Uh, if you add those two numbers up, I believe you get 49.9%. 
Uh, and then on the other side of things, 12% uh, to grants, 10% to the foundation, 8.1% is unallocated to be determined, 2% uh, donations, 9% uh, community rebates, and 9% community provisions. So you have 49.9% on one side, that's like the centralized team and investors, and you have 51, 50.1% uh, 50 on the other side, which is various forms of the community, the foundation, like long-term Starkware development. Uh, Ryan, what's your take on this distribution? Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, it seems kind of par for the course. 50% uh, is maybe a bit on the high side from an investor and kind of core uh, contributor perspective. 49.9% uh, actually. <laughs> Sorry, yes. <laughs> not quite 50%. Uh, but I don't know. It's just, you know, some of it's semantics, you know, 10% here, 10% there. I'm not really sure. The, the big question to me is like, how are they actually going to uh, distribute the tokens to their users and the community? How does that work? Do we have any right. details on that or a I timeline? I don't think here, we do. I don't think we do. No, okay, very so limited still, timeline. This is still an announcement to launch a token. And uh, you, you kind of wonder if they just did it a day after the Suzu news mm -hmm. came out and they kind of rushed it as a result. And so that might be part of the reason they don't have dates. Uh, not they, sure. They had all these, they had three blog posts and it came out. 24 hours after the Suzu announcement, that would be, I think they had this ready to fire. Yeah, maybe. Um, so yeah, so that's that's what's going on in Starkware world. How, how many more player twos are we waiting for now? ZK ZK's Sync. token? ZK Sync. Um, there are a couple others in the works too. Oh yeah. Oh, see, oh there's a ton. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's, has Aztec through, released their token a yet? Aztec has a token. There's Scroll that's still in development. Scroll, like, that's right. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of layer twos left. Uh, but they're like, these are between Starkware, Stark, uh, between Starkware, ZK Sync, Optimism, and Arbitrum. Arbitrum also needs to release a token. Those are like the big ones, I'd say. That's right. And they're probably all going to release their token during the bear market. So I yeah. guess we will see what happens yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, guys, coming up next, the story of Vitalik writing a book. I just found this out last week. What mm. is he writing? We'll talk a bit about that. Also, Ave launching a stablecoin. Is this going to be a DAI competitor? Or are they doing something else? And then... Finally, Disney and Polygon are teaming up. We'll talk a little bit about that. Before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. Arbitrum is an Ethereum layer two scaling solution that is going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Some of the coolest new NFT collections have chosen Arbitrum as their home, while DeFi protocols continue to see increased liquidity and usage. You can now bridge straight into Arbitrum from more than 10 different exchanges, including Binance, FTX, Huobi, and Crypto.com. Once on Arbitrum, you'll enjoy fast transactions with cheap fees, allowing you to explore new frontiers of the crypto universe. New to Arbitrum, for a limited time, you can get Arbitrum NFTs designed by the famous artists Ratwell and Sugoi for joining the Arbitrum Odyssey. The Odyssey is an eight week long event where you complete on-chain activities and receive a free NFT as a reward. Find out more by visiting the Discord at discord.gg slash Arbitrum. You can also bridge your assets to Arbitrum at bridge.arbitrum.io and access all of Arbitrum's apps at portal.arbitrum.1 in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be, fast, cheap, secure, and friction free. There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on, and now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. All right, guys, we're back. Uh, David, did you know that Vitalik is writing a book? Like, I know you know now, but did you know before last week? Uh, no, I knew it this week. I you knew, knew it this week? week. Yes. <laughs> oh, you found it? Okay, so, so I just learned this uh, last week and I was mm. like surprised because I follow what that man does. Like I read his <laughs> uh, research posts, all right? I stalk Vitalik Buterin <laughs> in a way. Notifications and, are on. Yeah, notifications are on and dialed up. Um, but uh, yeah, just learned he's coming out with a book. This book is set to release on September 13th, I mm -hmm. believe. It is now for sale on Amazon. It's called Proof of Stake, The Making of Ethereum, and the Philosophy of Blockchains. So um, he's co-writing this. It's not just Vitalik, right. but uh, there, there's another author, Nathan Schneider. Who no, I believe that's the editor. A, he's that's an editor, okay. Yeah. Uh, he's an academic uh, of some sort, and he actually jumped in the thread and was commenting. I was asking questions back, back and forth. Um, I'm anxious to read this. Mm -hmm. uh, the author or the editor says it's it's 
about making blocked giving giving uh, crypto and blockchains a f- philosophical underpinning and kind of separating it from the scams. Like it is a good thing for the world if you're a serious person and individual. And here's why Vitalik is making the case to a different crowd than probably the crowd that listens to Bankless. Or that is the attempt. It seems like that's mm-hmm. what the editor is saying anyway. Beautiful. I cannot wait to read that. That is exactly <laughs> the type of content that, that I'm looking for. I heard a funny joke somewhere that was like, hey, I'm starting to think this whole like Ethereum merge thing is really just a point to sell Vitalik's book. Hmm. Oh, well, the dates. Okay. Let me say September 13th. Is that also going to be the release it's date a, of the merge? It's a reasonable merge date. It's a reasonable merge It's not crazy, date. right? Yeah. I'm just saying, it's not crazy. Why not Vitalik is trying to book? sell his books. <laughs> oh, he's... The Bitcoiners are right. I knew he was a scammer. <laughs> it was all about this book. All, it's all about the this book. is the reason for starting <laughs> Ethereum. Just the long con, yeah. Vitalik. Long Good job, con. man. Um, all right, Ave. They're doing a stable coin. Yeah. I'm pretty excited about it. What are we talking about? Ave Bucks? Is that what it is? Ave Bucks, yeah. No, <laughs> Ave Bucks, stable oh. coin fears <laughs> with a proposed new token. So Ave okay. Companies, the centralized team uh, that s- stewards the Ave protocol, uh, propose a new dollar peg stable coin to the protocol calls DAO on July 7th. The GHO for ghosts, that's the Ave like uh, icon, like mascot, uh, will be minted by borrowing against assets locked as collateral on Ave. Borrowers will still earn yield on their deposited assets while also racking up interest on their borrowed GHO, according to Ave company's proposal. Interest payments will go directly to the Dow Treasury, of course, and can be considered revenue. Welcome, a welcome word in the bear market. Uh, the, this is the power of DeFi that GHO allows for more liquidity for decentralized stablecoins in the market, more fees for Ave, more volume and fees for Curve, more stability for other stablecoins, and more attractiveness of DeFi in general compared to CeFi. Wrote Mark Zeller, who works at Ave. So basically, it's it's like MakerDAO, but with a money market attached. So if you slammed like MakerDAO and Compound together, like boom, you would have the Ave stablecoin, which is great. It's That's smart. awesome. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's all collateral backed. It's collateralized. This is not like the Terra Luna fiasco mm-hmm. at all. So it's using the strengths of the Maker model and the strengths of Ave, which is the money market piece. Right. So is the thing going to be called Ghost? Go. Ghost, yeah, coins? go. That's gonna be the go stable. GHO, coin. so it's gonna be called GHO. go. Yeah. All right. I, I, th- I think. I mean, I, I am not the arbiter of the pronunciations. No. Uh, I, I think it's it's worth exploring and unpacking the differences of MakerDAO Dai versus Ave Go. Uh, so MakerDAO extremely risk adverse, extremely hardened, going after real world assets and like real world integrations. Where Ave is a little bit more uh, DeFi crypto native, going after maybe a little bit more of the long tail of risk. And not totally, not not totally down the long tail, but like opening up more total assets to mint go than you can put into maker data mint die so like we're starting to see some separation maker doubt like real world assets extremely risk adverse extremely conservative ave not super not totally super conservative still very risk adverse Ave's never been hacked in, in any way uh but also accepting a little bit more liberal on the long tail of crypto native tokens so you can start to see some divisions in like the decentralized stablecoin. i'm actually just so happy we have a second decentralized stablecoin. Oh, i think that's here. so great it's so great Missed opportunity to call it Ave Bucks. Maybe that's still on the table, guys. But if, you, if you're hearing me, not a bad name. But you know what's cool? Um, well, Ryan, we, <laughs> we, you know call- <laughs> we could call it Ave Bucks. We start that I meme. Was gonna say, you're, you're leaking the bankless stablecoin strategy of bankless bucks that we have. <laughs> oh, the, is that coming? Bankless, bankless bucks? bucks. What that's going to be? What is going to be the collateral that backs that, David? Oh, well, TBD. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> David's making stable coins on the fly. But um, do you know what's funny to me is how much, as you were describing it, how much things have changed for me? I used to think of Ave as, oh, that, that's pretty risky. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, I, I prefer Maker, Maker DAO. Maker DAO and yeah. If I'm, if I'm, bo- if I'm um, taking margin out or mm-hmm. taking a loan out of my ETH, I'll do Maker DAO rather than Ave. Ave just seems so blue chip and yeah. so yeah. risk off now. Yeah. And I think part of that is like, they've done a great job. Mm-hmm. And Lindy Effect, they've been here for a couple of years and it's it's worked very well. The other part of that is the Overton window has completely shifted. Right. So now <laughs> it's we've we went in this bull cycle way right. out on the risk spectrum. Right. We saw things like Luna mm-hmm. and uh UST and that whole implosion, all these algorithmic stable coins and like what's happened with, with uh C yeah. lending, mm-hmm. right? Like those the, the safe places like BlockFi and Celsius to deposit your funds have completely exploded. Now I'm like, Ave is just, it just seems so safe. It yeah. seems so blue chip. Mm-hmm. It seems so 
grandma ready. Mm -hmm. And that's totally changed for me in the last couple of years. Totally. All the things that are still alive right now, uh, I mean, we, we still have to make it to the other side of the bull market, but it seems like the most of the downside volatility has happened already. So like if, it, if it's going to break at a protocol level, it would have broken by now. So like all the, all the stable coins that exist today, I feel like you can definitely start to like endorse these things pretty, pretty well. You could have always endorsed DAI, like Aave, the stable coin. I don't think it really adds any new risk to the Aave protocol. Um, it's a new product, not necessarily a new like risk vector, I'd say. Um, and, then, and then also Frax. Like killed it this 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 bear market in a good way in a good way like killed it to the to the upside. They're doing well. <laughs> They're doing. They didn't well. die. Yeah. They survived. Uh, like uh, uh, UST goodbye. Uh, Wonderland. You know Mim. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's gone. Or for the most part, it is. Anyways, I wouldn't trust it personally. Uh, but now we have like three really awesome decentralized stable coins uh, optimizing for three different things. Uh, so you know, it's bear market, build market. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely great. Uh, big week for um, Matic as well this week mm -hmm. in, in Polygon. So the first bit of news is uh, Robinhood just started allowing deposits and withdrawal support for mm -hmm. Matic and for Polygon. So that's another fiat bridge, fiat gateway. And Robinhood, of course, I don't know, 20, 25 million users, something like this, mm -hmm. uh, now have a way to get directly onto Polygon. Also, some breaking news from Polygon they are excited to be the only blockchain mm -hmm. chosen to be part of the Disney Accelerator program. What is this, yeah. David? Yeah, so six companies selected to be a part of the Disney's 2022 Accelerator program. I didn't know this existed, but now I do. Uh, is a business and development program designed to spur the growth of innovative companies around the world. Uh, this program, which starts in a week, so like next week, uh, is looking to develop technologies with augmented, augmented reality, non-fungible tokens, and artificial intelligence. I mean, you can kind of just guess and see, imagine for yourself how those things fit into a Disney product, right? Like, I don't think it takes that much imagination to put those things together. Uh, during the course of the program, each participating company will receive guidance from Disney's senior leadership team, as well as a uh, dedicated executive mentor. And like, uh, like Ryan said, Polygon is the only blockchain native pol uh, platform selected in the six company lineup. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah, good for them. A good business development, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, always waiting for Disney is the, the giant of IP right. in the world to start right. doing things with the Marvel Universe, the Star Wars Universe, or like Mickey Mouse and Friends mm -hmm. uh, in NFTs. And um, maybe this is a way to explore that as well a bit more. David. This, oh, this is really, really cool. Uh, yeah, okay, man. So this What's is the, happening? This, this is the, uh, the ENS markets. Uh, ENS markets, uh, I always like to say, there's always a bull market somewhere. Even in the midst of this bear market, somebody's still making money. And right now, it is uh, the ENS uh, domain name holders, uh, and specifically certain clubs of holders. These clubs have, have come out of like the ether. So we have like the 999 club, which is uh, anyone who owns numbers 000 through 999.eth, you are in the 999 club. Then there's also the 10K club, which, you know, add, add another digit. Uh, I'm in the 10K club. Thank you. Uh, and what number do you have? Uh, I actually don't know. It starts with 6842, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think. I don't know. Okay. Um, uh, but then there's also other clubs, right? There's like Arabic number clubs. Like a bunch of clubs are being established. And it's basically like uh, this like bottom up, like non non ERC-20 token DAO, right? So it's like there's these clubs. Uh, and so there's this tweet thread that has a bunch of these uh, uh, metrics that I'll read out here. With a current floor price of 25 ETH, the 999 club has quickly become the most expensive of all the ENS clubs and now is considered an icon of ENS domains. Uh, to look into the 999 club, we've pulled addresses of all 506 different holders of, of the 1,999 uh, uh, ENS names. Uh, the first thing we notice is the lowest amount of paper hands that we've ever seen, 2.4%. I'm pretty sure what that means is only 2.4% of total holders has sold. Uh, I think that's like four or five, six people. Uh, uh, this is the highest of the category classified by this particular algorithm. Uh, and 168 of these holders uh, of the 506 have their ENS domain as their primary ENS name record. Uh, and so like they, they, their number is actually like registered to their Ethereum address. So like 33% of these holders are using these digits as their e, uh, ENS identity. Uh, and so next up is the 10K club, which is like uh, uh, 1,000 through 9,999.eth. Uh, a larger amount of supply and a 1.6 ETH floor, the 10K club has a uh, unsurprisingly higher ratio of paper hands, but to, to pr 
put things in perspective, the ratio is still higher than things like Azuki's or Doodles. The 10K Club is made up of 4,368 wallets. 218 of them also own a 999 Club ENS. That means almost half of the 999 Club also owns a four-digit ENS name. Uh, this time, 668 holders have defined their address as an ENS primary domain. Uh, ratio is lower than the 99M Club, but the network effect is still greater with four times as many people sh uh, flexing their four-digit numbers. Uh, and this is just the numbers club. There, like I said, there are other number the clubs, ENS clubs in the ENS game. Uh, you can check them out at ENS.vision. What what is with this? Why is this happening? So I, first of all, let me say dot People, ETHs, humans like tribes, Ryan. <laughs> okay, but like first of all, like uh, dot ETHs are I think the perfect bear market NFT to mm -hmm. start trading. I don't yeah. know, it just feels so essential, right. so you know it's close to around, the metal, right? So foundational. Like so I get that aspect of it after fashion, but like why now? Mm -hmm. ENS has been around forever. Why are we suddenly now in July of 2022 and also June and May, mm -hmm. why are we now getting this degen right. uh, bull market on ENSs? Uh, can, can you explain this to me? Yeah, I actually do have an answer for that. Like, Well, some part is just like, uh, you know, ghosts in the machine. Like some people just like to trade things. But also I'll say that, you know, a lot of uh, new NFT speculators that came in bought Ether at higher prices, much higher prices than they are now. And so like ENS names are a great tax loss harvesting NFT to purchase after you bought your 4,000K Ether and now it's down to $1,000. Uh, so you can buy an ENS name because it's still, if you're buying an ENS name, you're still longing Ethereum mostly. So you get to tax loss harvest all that Ether that you bought, but and you can also buy an NFT that you know is not going anywhere. Unlike like all the other like JPEG NFTs that are opinionated, like do you like the cats? Do you like the punks? Do you like the apes? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, everyone plays the, in the NF, ENS game. Like, you, you, Ryan, have an ENS name. I've got an ENS name. We're, we're considered, like, DeFi people more than we are NFT people. But even us have ENS names, right? Uh, and so uh, that, I think. And also, just, like, the, there's historical relevancy. Like, the DNS don't world has made people bajillions of dollars. And so, like, we're just repeating history again. I get it. I get it. I get all these arguments. And a nice pro t tax tip, by the way, David. I'm, pr I'm yeah, proud like of that man. one. That was good. That was good. <laughs> tax loss harvesting is awesome. Um, but okay. But like all of that stuff was true before now. Like why yeah, but now, now this... people have like JPEGs just leave a bad taste in people's mouths now. Ah, that mm, might be it. Yeah. So people are like anti-image, anti-JPEG. Yeah. And they're like, I want something real. Yeah. Give me and something. It, they're, they're, it's a proxy for Ethereum. Okay, and dot ETHs are like, it's a proxy for Ethereum, but it's also like, it's tangible, mm. it's real, it has right. utility. What can you do with a dot ETH? Anything, like you can, right. it's it's a human readable name for any Ethereum address or any, mm -hmm. I guess, in address in general on the internet. And that has utility and maybe that's where the market's going for NFTs. Yeah, yeah, so like, you know, I think CryptoPunks are cool, but like that doesn't necessarily, that's not a universally held opinion, right? Like some people think CryptoPunks are cringe, even though those people are wrong. Um, but like if you are walk into a club, a metaverse club, and you have 000.eth as your name, everyone thinks you're cool. Really? Like so it's, you it's, it's a flex. universal signal. I think that's it, man. I think the explanation is right. exactly what you said. JPEGs are out. JPEGs right. are out. Well, so what are the what JPEGs are, the other are NFTs? universally out, but like again, it's they're more. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've read so many takes this week about like just in mainstream media about like mm -hmm. NFTs being a scam and like right. just it's endless, man. JPEGs right. are just not right. JPEGs aren't appearing on Jimmy Kimmel these days. Right. That's for yeah, damn that's sure. True. Right. That's it's true. like well, totally out of yeah. mainstream culture. Except Bill Murray being <laughs> countercultural. <laughs> he went and he bought a cool cat this week. Yeah. So nice cat. That's cat Bill Murray. It actually, Bill Murray. I, I, that's the cool cat that I would expect Bill Murray to purchase. Do you know he's like buying the, the dip here? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good for him. Um, yeah. Well, one more thing on the ENS names before, before we move on. I think this needs to be like uh, uh, seconded, but I think this whole thing got started when people noticed like a bunch of uh, people in like Arab countries buying number, number ENS names and like the, the license plate, low digit, uh, license plates in like places like the United Arab Emirates are like similarly status symbols. So like people will huh. pay big numbers for like low digit license plate numbers. And so like ENS, it's like an even bigger market. Uh, and so I think this got triggered in the East and now like the West is like, oh, we also want to play this game. And now the game's on. Have you ever, have you ever had a personal license plate, David? No, That's I haven't. Something. Yeah. Bankless. E. Uh, Bankless is sadly eight letters. I actually did. No, 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 no. B-N-K-L-E-S-S. -S. We could do that. I could, I could get yeah, mine, Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I don't, I don't know, have I'm a not car. into it. <laughs> you don't have a car. Okay. I don't have a car anymore. You're out. <laughs> okay. I have a minivan. A confession. Do you have so a minivan? I'm not putting that on. <laughs> yeah, dude. You know I have kids and everything. I will take a picture of my minivan and show it to you. <laughs> I don't think, well, don't, it's a Honda put your, Odyssey, don't, baby. don't put your license plate online, though. So don't oh, do that. Yeah. Good, good call. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. OPSEC yeah. Uh, yeah. lesson for you as yeah. well. Uh-huh. Um, GameStop finally launched their NFT marketplace mm-hmm. as well. What is this thing looking like, David? Yeah, this is Matt Feinstone. Uh, Used to be at Loopering, now at GameStop. And he goes, GM, everyone, GameStop NFT is live in beta, non-custodial Ethereum Layer 2 marketplace where the community can truly own the digital assets that they love. You can check it out at nft.gamestop.com. And so now this is The Verge. GameStop's NFT marketplace has arrived just in time for a crypto market crash. God, they they just can't let us give us a break. (laughs) Yeah, let it be fun. Come on, Verge. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, buy, sell, create NFTs on the GameStop NFT marketplace. Over 200 uh, collections are on there with more than 53,000 NFTs listed. Uh, and you can connect the newly launched GameStop wallet, which we talked about a few weeks ago, to your digital assets. Uh, you can also use options like um, uh, Wallet Connect and MetaMask. Uh, right now, uh, you can, not everyone can put NF- uh, create an NFT. Only certain creators can apply, but I'm sure they're going to open up in the future. But also, of course, GameStop, it's got the word game in the name, Ryan. They're about a they're gaming company. Uh, They have bigger plans than address a marketplace down the line. They said in a press release that it plans to expand functionality into areas like Web3 Gaming. On the NFT marketplace, GameStop is already teasing support for Immutable X, a platform on Ethereum that's uh, used by some NFT games, is coming soon. Uh, Also, previously, we've talked about the uh, $100 million grant program between GameStop and Immutable to help build out the world of Web3 Gaming. So you can just imagine, it's like, oh, I'm playing my game. I found my super awesome like uh, like long sword of Flame, it's worth ten thousand dollars. I'm going to take it to the GameStop marketplace and sell it. Like you could totally see that world. At least this I do. is pretty cool. I like yeah. it. And what is this built on? So it, I know it's a layer two. Do you know what the marketplace is built on? Is it immutable? Is it loop ring? Is it some combo of both? Uh, that is a good question. I do not know. It's we'll one. Of, it's one of those two things. It's one Follow of those two up. things. Oh, immutable X coming soon. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what I talked about. They're teasing it. So like, what is it currently based on? I mean, yeah. I bet you. I bet you. It's uh, if it's not both now, it will be later. That's a question for Matt. We'll go find yeah. out, guys, and, and yeah. let you know. But it is on Layer 2, and that's mm-hmm. pretty cool. I would guess yeah. it's either Immutable or Loop Ring or some combo of both. Yeah. Um, David, let's get to <laughs> some Bitcoin stuff. I guess this isn't Bitcoin stuff. It's maybe Bitcoin tribe stuff. Yeah. Uh, Michael Saylor this week quoted as saying, Ethereum is obviously a security. Obviously, obviously David. Um, I think Ethereum is a security, he says. I think it's pretty obvious. It was issued by an ICO. There's a management team. There was a pre-mine. There was a hard fork. There's continual hard forks. There's a difficulty bomb that keeps pushing back. Uh, And then he says, I think all proof-of-stake networks are securities, all of them, and they're all very risky. It's above my pay grade. The regulators will decide whether or not they will allow them to continue or not. It's the only good take he had. The regulators will allow. I don't know that the regulators get to decide whether the networks continue, but I guess they get to establish some sort of stamp of legitimacy on them. David, do you think that this is just some uh, insecurity here about ETH being a security or ETH not being a security? Um, Do you think that like Bitcoin or Bitcoin maximalists, let me say, are threatened by Ethereum? I mean, we've had they've always they always happen. The CFTC has. Uh, clearly stated multiple times that Ether is a commodity. Mm -hmm. We've had um, senior members of the SEC say that as well. Ether is a commodity along with Bitcoin. Group it in here. We've Mm -hmm. had um, a long period of time since the initial ICO, the continuing acceptance, more decentralization of uh, Ethereum over the years. There haven't been strong indications that any senior officials in the US actually are targeting Ethereum as a security. So Regardless of whether it's a, whether you think it's a security or not, under the definition of a security, it doesn't seem to be that's the direction the regulators right. are trying to proceed and right. pursue. What do you think about this? Yeah, this this is the classic old man yells at cloud meme. Uh, like Bitcoiners, for, for people that have been on crypto Twitter for longer than like this bull market, this is like a, just a classic talking point of. Bitcoin maxis about Ethereum. Like, oh, there was a pre-mine. 
oh, Vitalik controls everything. Meanwhile, Vitalik holds the record for the most ignored and unemerged EIP addresses or EIPs uh, to Ethereum. Uh, fun fact. Uh, like, uh, like you know, no no control over the monetary supply. Like you know, blah blah blah. Like all these like talking points. ETH is a security. Uh, you know, Vitalik's a scammer. Anyone who thinks of Vitalik's a scammer, like that's a legitimate take that people have on crypto Twitter. Like Vitalik is a scammer. He's building a scam. He's the biggest scammer of all time. Like that's just ridiculous. And so like this whole like ether is a security thing. It's really just like th there's like this very strong do not break ranks culture in Bitcoin in the Bitcoin camp. Uh, and this is like one of those talking points that that they say it's like, but, no, only buy Bitcoin because everything else is a security. It has got to be the least cypherpunk take yeah. I've ever heard from Bitcoin right. maximalists, mm -hmm. which is like, hey, nation state, like, come help make mm -hmm. make Ether right. a security, please, because, you know, it's just in the interest of their bags. I, I don't understand. I mean, I would think that like hardcore Bitcoiners, hardcore uh, Bitcoin maximalists, Aren't they like, don't they skew liber libertarian? Aren't Super. we trying to get away yeah. from kind of like nation state uh, control of our right. monetary system right. and that and the entire point? So let mm. assets compete. Why not let assets compete? I, I don't understand the appeal to um, Papa Gensler to mm. come take a look at Ethereum and, and put get them in trouble. Right. Um, yeah, that, it, well, I, it's, it's libertarianism when it's about Bitcoin, but if it's about anything else, it's their like super status. Like the Bitcoin maximalist is like a state. And if you go against the will of the state, they come at you with their cyber hornet army. Are you a Bitcoin maximalist? Come come at David and I and tell oh, us yeah, why we're wrong. About I've this. heard it all. <laughs> do you think, I've heard do it you think all. Bitcoin maximalists listen to Bankless anymore, I, David? I, I, probably not. Probably. Well, no, because you're not allowed. You're not, you're not allowed to like consume anything that's like it, it, it's literally like one of these not like allowed. extremist religions. Like you are not allowed to receive education outside of the Bitcoin state. You are not. You are not allowed to to fl uh, flirt with the enemy. You are not allowed to go on <laughs> other people's podcasts. Like you, you have to stay inside of the Bitcoin cult. And if you go outside of the cult, like you'll be uh, exiled. Like look what happened to Nick Carter. Like the same, the same just extreme tribalism exists in, like beyond Bitcoin maximalism, and it's a part of Bitcoin maximalism. You're a Bitcoin maximalist. Don't you dare flirt with Bankless. Turn don't this you, episode off dare. right now. Yeah. Do not dare. <laughs> um, you know, even even Dan Held. And uh, some prominent right. Bitcoiners actually rejected mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the take you, of yeah. Ethereum being a, uh, a security and, and right. agreed with uh, our takes here. Anyway, right. uh, let's get to some releases, some good news here. What is this? Pseudo AMM. Mm -hmm. Pseudo AMM from Pseudo Swap. This is uh, NFT liquidity infrastructure. So some quick tidbits about what this actually is. It's a AMM for NFTs, uh, but you know you got to get a little bit more creative because it's not that simple. Uh, but three things you can really do: you can create pools that gradually buy or sell NFTs along price curves. You can provide liquidity to pools to buy and sell those NFTs to earn fees, uh, and you can directly list all of your NFTs at fixed prices. Uh, liquidity providers have full control over their pools pricing; they can address it at any time. And there's endless possibilities for new pricing models. Basically, there is uh, more infrastructure for liquidity on NFTs. Like NFT financialization really needs to improve. There's so much left to do. Are uh, you bullish on this category? Oh, big As, like, time. Like an NFT, NFT DeFi integration. Like NFTs are super illiquid and they yep. need to be more liquid in order to be more adopted and just useful. Uh, and so we have things like collateralized NFT infrastructure. Like this is, is also another one. Just like things that provide liquidity to NFTs, I'm pretty bullish on. Yeah, I think this is alpha, guys. I think a yeah. lot of uh, NFT five building is going to happen during the bear market, and um, you're going to see the fruits of that 100%. in the next bull cycle. Um, also, this LensTube. What Lens is this? Tube. An open source Web three video sharing social media platform built on top of Lens Protocol yeah. and live on Polygon. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there's two uh, protocols in the back end here. One is LivePeer, which has been around for a while, just like uh, decentralized video transcoding and streaming, uh, and then Arweave for the data. So the, the data is all on Arweave. Uh, LivePeer does all the video transcoding, uh, and then like LensTube is the front end. So they're connecting all the dots for you. And here's our here's my friend uh, Gabriel Haynes. Uh, crypto Twitter will recognize him. Um, uh, so yeah, you, there's now a more decentralized alternative uh, for YouTube. David, we gotta we gotta do this. Look at yeah. Gabriel; he's got some subscribers oh, here. We gotta we gotta that. set up our uh, LensTube account mm -hmm. on Bankless. Guys, some big raises this week. The first Lightspeed raised seven billion dollars across four funds and launched a new crypto native team. That is absolutely colossal mm -hmm. raise. Seven billion dollars yeah. during the bear market. Who's got seven billion dollars these days? Apparently, Lightspeed. 
Apparently, now they do. Also, uh, Multicoin Capital launched a $430 million venture fund. I think the theme here is um, it's a good time to deploy capital in the bear market. I think right. smart funds have raised or gotten the commitments to raise in the in the bull market mm -hmm. or using their reputation in order to keep raising and are planning to deploy a lot during yeah. the bear market. This is why this is feels much different than mm -hmm. 2018, David, when... Right. No one was like you wouldn't see any of these this level of raises like everything completely dried up. Now people are mm -hmm. still investing. Yeah, I mean, I think VCs are just like licking their lips. It's like the time the power has shifted back into the camp of VCs, where in 2021 the power was in the the hands of founders and builders. Like if you had a product, you could raise infinite amount of money and infinite valuation. And like VCs were having to push out other VCs to get into deals. Now it's the inverse. Now the VCs are like, ha. Power is back in our side now. Like we've <laughs> got all goes. the money and you've got we none of it. We set the terms. Yeah, now, we not set you. the terms. So yeah, VC financialized, capitalized VCs are uh, in a good spot. In a good it's spot. good because private valuations were getting Crazy. nutty, absolutely yeah. insane compared yeah. to public as mm -hmm. well. Um, this is LiFi. They just raised five point five million in a strategic mm -hmm. ecosystem round. This is a bridging aggregator yeah. uh, technology. Pretty cool. David not, and I, not just a bridge aggregator, a bridge and DEX aggregator, aggregator. Uh, ah, and so, super aggregator. so it gets you from chain A to chain B while simultaneously getting you from asset one to asset two at the same time. I mean, you can just imagine in a blossoming of, of blockchains, both uh, la alternative layer ones and many, many layer twos, and also assets, you can just like teleport from chain to chain while also uh, swapping assets at the same time. And it just routes your order through the you know, in the best possible way to make sure you preserve all your capital while you go through that. Chain teleportation, that's, chain that's teleportation, better than chain yeah. bridging, David. And, like and asset teleportation. Uh, and David and I are investors in this one too. Just yeah. a small portion of angel investors. Also, Chris Dixon, mm -hmm. he uh, just funded Farcaster. And what's cool about this is I don't use Farcaster, um, but it seems kind of cool. And I could imagine myself using this years ago. This is basically like RSS Plus. And I, I remember one of Chris's initial um, theses like 10 years ago uh, and A16Z more broadly was that RSS would kind of take off as an open protocol, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And that world didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. Instead, we got kind of the the social media closed ecosystems of right. like, you know, Twitter and, you know, Facebook and other social networks and like even the sub stacks of the world. I think his thesis is the reason it didn't work is because RSS as a protocol did not have value payments. capture, did not have a token, mm -hmm. did not have money, did not have payments. And now I think this is another attempt at that to revitalize this protocol, which is RSS, and to add a business layer on top of it. I haven't looked at the details, but um, you know, I, I recall that being one of uh, hmm. one of Chris's um, talking points and, and theses. Cool, cool. I'm a big fan. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, this is this is Web three re uh, like reinvigorating Web one, and there are a lot of cool things about Web one. Not that I was there for it. <laughs> totally. Um, Gnosis Safe. They just raised a hundred million dollars led by one mm -hmm. KX. Gnosis. I mean, Gnosis is great. Just a great tool for mm -hmm. uh, you know, storing storing funds in a multi sig type way. A uh, hundred million dollars. Apparently, I bet they raised some of that during the uh, the bull run and are announcing it now. Yeah. Uh, any takes on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone uses this product, right? Like everyone has, um, not everyone, a lot of people have multi-sigs. I have a personal multi-sig that I use. Uh, Ryan and I have the bankless multi-sig. Uh, like basically every single DAO's treasury is inside of the Gnosis multi-sig. They're also rebranding it. This is also a rebrand to SAFE. So take off the Gnosis and just add SAFE. Uh, and so it basically is, it, it's of, of all contracts in, uh, in Ethereum, here's a good bit of trivia. Of, uh, Gnosis SAFE, now, now called SAFE, has stored and secured the most value across Ethereum over time. So like it has the biggest like TVL of assets locked. Uh, that's because of just how simple, stupid the contracts are. And it's just like a basic multi-sig. And it's just battle tested, man, Yeah. right? Like there's $40 billion in there. I didn't know NFTs were in here too. 13% yep. of all crypto punks are in safe hmm. right now. Um, pretty cool. I need, I need to put mine in there. <laughs> Good to see them continuing to invest there. Mm -hmm. And of course, with all of this investment money, that means there are jobs available for you. Yeah, what do yeah. we tell you every single week? Get a Good job, job in crypto if you can. And I'm here to tell you, you can. 
because there are some companies that are hiring. There is a jobs board that is ready to feed you those jobs. Let me read a few. Smart contract, software engineer, Stakefish, backend, full stack, software engineer, Stakefish, blockchain marketer, Stakefish, front end engineer, software <laughs> engineer, uh, Stakefish, DevOps engineer, Stakefish. They want a lot of engineering talent. Looks like Alliance Dow looking for a CTO, also a software engineer, also a senior software engineer, also an executive assistant. It's on technical. Otter Space wants a Solidity engineer. Uniswaps is hiring. Are You Generous is hiring. Chainlink is hiring. Argent is hiring. Tally is hiring. I could go on, but I won't. You can see all of these job positions, the bankless.palette.com slash jobs. Go check those out. Uh, all right, David, what are we on to next, my friend? Uh, sponsors. Ron's a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> taking a quick break to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. But then we're going to come back and talk about questions from the nation, st- uh, takes of the week, and what David and Ryan are bullish on, and of course, the meme of the week. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across is critical ecosystem infrastructure, and Across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, layer two to layer two transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your layer two transferring needs. So go to across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 60 million monthly active users. And inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the secure multi-chain crypto wallet built right into the browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy, but there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. And most crypto wallets are browser extensions, which can easily be spoofed. But the Brave wallet is different. No extensions are required, which gives Brave browser an extra level of security versus other wallets. Brave wallet is your secure passport for the possibilities of Web3, and supports multiple chains, including Ethereum and Solana. You can even buy crypto directly inside the wallet with RAMP. And of course, you can store, send, and swap your crypto assets, manage your NFTs, and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps. So whether you're new to crypto or you're a seasoned pro, it's time to ditch those risky extensions, and it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. All right, guys, we are back. If you have a question for David and I on the weekly roll-up, we will answer your question. The way to do that is look for this tweet coming to the Bankless HQ Twitter account, ask you questions. Here's the first question I'm gonna ask you. I think it's the difference between proof of stake and proof of work. This is from Jeremy Mef, uh, Mef- Mefford. 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 It's not that Sorry, hard, Jeremy. <laughs> I know. I, I overcomplicated your name, Jeremy. Uh, I haven't heard a POS, that's proof of stake, proponent address this point from proof of work people very well. Proof of stake leads to the rich getting richer within that system. Drake's answer to Alden was unsurprisingly uh, was surprisingly unsatisfactory. That's Justin Drake in a Bankless podcast episode he's referring to. Is this just a trade off that is lived with due to other benefits proof of stake brings? Mm-hmm. So, what of this idea that proof of stake is just the rich getting richer, David? Yeah. Also, it's on the topic of talking points that Bitcoin maximalists talk about all the time, this is one of those things. Like proof of stake is just like the rich get richer paradigm. A lot of they also call it like this is a fiat paradigm. Is like the people with the bigger stake have the bigger say. That's all totally, completely wrong. It's just, it's like such a, a swing and a miss. And so I'll do my best to like summarize it here. To the question of what, which one has higher returns on capital. The cool thing about proof of stake is we know exactly how big the returns on capital are. Uh, in right now, I think the stake rate is 4.2%. Uh, Post merge, it'll jump up to seven and then it'll come back down. It'll be some sort of equilibrium between like 5%, 5, 6%, 4 to 6%. We don't really know until it happens, but like 4 to 6% ballpark year over year returns on Ether. So, like that, that is how much capital begets capital in the world of proof of stake. In proof of work, people don't associate with like capital begetting capital because like there's this work word and you have to do work in order to like mine the blockchain. But it, like you're not really doing doing work, you're just racing to consume as much electricity as possible. The cool thing about proof of stake is that it cuts out so many middlemen that preserve the ability for individuals to actually participate in this game. In the world of proof of stake, there are so many middlemen that separate 
$1 from turning into $1 worth of security. And this is really the thing you need to optimize for is if you have $1 of capital, how do you produce $1 worth of security? And proof of stake is going to like direct, like coupling those things directly. Proof of work has so many middlemen that separate $1 worth of uh, capital from $1 of security. So you have like the mining facility, you have to m buy all of the hardware. You have to house the hardware in a big facility. You have to cool the facility. You need a ton of electricity. So like a lot of uh, Bitcoin mining facilities build their own power plant to, at, this, at this point. You need to have supply chains with ASIC manufacturers. That starts to be having like political connections. Do you have actual like political connections to the manufacturers? So you need to invest in all of these things that that aren't hash rate. And everything that you have to invest in is a, is a place where economies of scale can be expressed. So like the difference is, is like if you put in $1,000 into Ether and you get 6% on your Ether year over year, you, and, or if you put in a, a billion dollars or a million dollars, like pick your number of digits, everyone gets the exact same amount of interest rate on their Ether year over year. In proof of work, if you cannot start a proof of work farm with $1,000 or $10,000 or $100,000, you'll be completely uncompetitive. So in order to play the game of proof of work, like mining, you have to invest tens of millions of dollars into a proof of work mining operation to be viable because the economies of scale are so incredibly large. And the crazy thing is, is like if you put in $10 million, you will get some amount of hash rate. But if you put in $100 million, you are going to get far more than 10 times the amount of hash rate because it returns it, it, fav it favors capital and so like the returns on proof of work on capital investments into proof of work mining are far greater than six percent it's something like 50 to 100 to 150 percent depending on how professional your mining operation is so compare the proof of the six to seven percent yield on proof of stake to like the 50 to 150 percent yield on a, a bitcoin proof of work mining operation that is the rich get richer model and so like the the only reason why people think that it's proof of stake is because it's actually formally a part of the actual system is like, yes, you get compound interest and people are like, oh, compound interest, like that's the rich get richer. No, like, I'm sorry, are, who is cutting a uh, hundred million, like, are you cutting a hundred million dollar or ten million dollar like PPM, private placement mem mem memorandum for your Bitcoin mining operation? Like, no, you're not. Only the rich are doing that. Yeah. Uh, and rant. Yeah, yeah. So I agree with all of that. And here, here's, I guess, one way to think of it. So first of all, it's, it's important to acknowledge both systems are the rich get richer. Right. Like a, ca a, a capital system is the rich get right. richer. But proof of work is like 10 times worse than proof say, of stake. I would say larger, larger than Maybe that. larger. But like proof of stake is actually uh, an improvement mm -hmm. on the rich get richer. It's not as bad. It's, it's, the minim it's literally the minimization of rich get, get richer. It's because again, of, if you have 32 ETH or 3200 ETH or 32,000 ETH, you get the same amount of yield no matter what. It's kind of like the rich get richer in the same way that investing in, like in an ideal world, uh, treasuries or you know sovereign right. bonds are the rich get richer. It's sort mm -hmm. of like that. That's 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 one important part. And then the other important part to understand is um, proof of work is just proof of stake with, with extra, extra steps, steps. Yeah. right? And so here here's what we mean. Here's what you're saying. Here is like in both cases it requires capital, right? Okay. And like what are these ASIC machines that you're using? Right. They're tokens. They're for except, forced alignment to the protocol. Yes, except these tokens are much harder to get. And I'm talking about the ASICs. You wouldn't think of them as you think of them as hardware, computer hardware in the real world. Mm -hmm. Well, they're like tokens. They're units of right. capital mm -hmm. to charge. And so, if you think of them as uh, physical tokens, essentially, the difference between buying an ASIC and putting it in a massive data center, like the supply chain, the right. you have to have connections, like energy right. consumption. Manufacturing. You have to be a company and a very sophisticated company with business development team, with like location, with physical space in order to do that versus with Ethereum and, and any staking network, you can buy your token on freaking Uniswap. Right. And that's your unit of capital. How much more accessible is that? Mm -hmm. I think that is another important difference to understand. So. And so like, I think the, the counter argument will be like, oh yeah, like Bitcoin miners, they have to expend all of this extra money. You have to buy, you have to expend your rewards to uh, buy the ASICs. You have to expend your rewards to pay for the mining operations. You have to expend the rewards to pay for energy. Like that is, that is risk and that is baked into the returns. 
And so actually, the more risk that there is, the more expenses there are, the only reason why people are going to do that are because the returns are literally higher as a result of that risk. Yeah. Yeah, um, totally. Well, I think we've talked about that for, we, yeah. we get excited talking yeah. about this. I, I wrote an article covering this called Four Misconceptions Between Proof of Work, Proof of Stake that like, in my mind, I think is the clearest articulation into these arguments. So if you want to explore that more, go read that article. I'm going to make a big mistake and ask you another question that you're yeah, probably you equally passionate yeah, about, <laughs> which is my question for the bank, for you, David. What does David have against carbs? Ryan Sean Adams asked this question for the roll-up. Okay, what do so you have against carbs, man? For, okay, so people not, not on crypto Twitter, I just randomly decided to like pick up this anti-carb campaign. Uh, and like it actually caught a lot of my followers by surprise. Like, oh, David read like a, a magazine on keto and now he's like a keto maximalist. Uh, people don't actually know that I actually studied this in college and consulted on it for a couple of years after school. Uh, so like I have actually, I have this in my background. You're uh, really against carbs. Not, not, no, too, okay, no, it's, that's mostly a meme. Okay, okay. so like the, the typical American <laughs> diet is something like, 70% carbs, 20% fats, and 10% proteins, when like the optimum balanced diet is something like 50 to 60% fats, like 20% pro, uh, like 40 to 50 to 60% fats, like 20-ish percent protein, and like 20% carbs. Like that is actually a true balanced diet, like heavily weighted in fats and like not nearly as much weighted in carbs. Uh, and so like, <laughs> and so like the, 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 cra the crazy thing is like in the same way that like the, <laughs> the government controls the price of the dollar, they're also controlling the price of corn. The reason why there's literally high fructose corn syrup in everything is because corn, making high fructose corn syrup is basically free. And there's nothing worse for you than goddamn high fructose <laughs> corn syrup. It's literally <laughs> everywhere. It's completely, so it's like, it's, it's, it's sugar. It's a big filler. And it's also highly addictive. You know, it's a great business model, Ryan. Carbs. Everyone's addicted to them. They show up, you know, you know, carbs show up in the brain. Uh, they fire the brain, uh, the parts of the areas of the brain that the same place that uh, cocaine and heroin do. And like just as much sugar does like absolutely crazy. So like <laughs> it's a crazy business model. Like we're, we're, we're suing these, uh, the, that one family for like getting everyone addicted to painkillers. Like the, the f big food industry is doing the same thing with carbs. You're just addicted to carbs. Carbs, carbs are the opioids that no one notices, yes, David. That's exactly right. Right. Dude, I don't, I don't want to get you started on this, okay? Because <laughs> it's a long... I, I can tell you've got a lot to say. I, Bankless Nation, who would enjoy an episode on Bankless, maybe some side stream or something, with David on nutrition? Because okay, I so would actually like to school up with you. I've already, got, I've, it's, I've already got it in the works. I've already oh, it's already happening. Works. Yeah, so, so there's this guy I, who I listen to, uh, Anthony Gustain. Uh, he would do the Perfect Keto podcast, which is now rebranded into something else. Anyways, the, the way that this, this is not just like David going rogue and doing a nutrition podcast. There's like the, the, the world of agriculture and sustainable agriculture is very much tied to decentralization. Whereas we have like highly centralized production of corn and factory farmed meats, which are terrible, both for like your health and for the animal. Uh, and everything is super centralized and like a, a way, and that's, we can't live on this planet that way. Like it, it can't work that way. We're going to kill the planet. The, what does make us work on this planet is sustainable agriculture, which is inherently tied into the concept of decentralization. Like robust, anti-fragile, like harmony with nature farms that are distributed all across the world in a very decentralized manner that is in harmony with nature, that is robust, that is longevity, uh, that's, and especially as like global supply chains break down and like we can't cooperate with Europe or China or anything. Like we need local at home decentralized sustainable agriculture food production, which Ryan is veggies and meat, veggies and meat. <laughs> I have opinions on this thing. All right. David doing a <laughs> nutrition podcast is just about the most bear market thing I can think of, right? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to personally somehow, end the bear market with this I am podcast. somehow <laughs> intrigued by it and I want to learn more. Uh, last thing here is there, there was some talk of David doing a dance. So uh, Anthony Sassano, he was supposed to do a dance at a certain mm -hmm. point when ETH hit a price point. And I think that mm -hmm. price point was hit. What was yeah. that? Was that like a thousand? I think it, no, it was all time high. Um, by the end of 2020, and we hit that. 2020, and we hit and he it. He didn't in pay his debt. Yeah, he didn't. Right? Pay his he, debt. Didn't, he didn't do the dance. So he, this he is owes David. Crypto Twitter a dance. This is David Hoffman, my co-host here. Okay, <laughs> not just a nutrition podcast, not just a crypto expert, but apparently you know how to do the Napoleon Dynamite dance. <laughs> oh, I do You're not, not doing know how it to here. Do the Napoleon oh, so Dynamite. you have to learn first. <laughs> yeah. David says this: if ETH hits all-time high by end of 2023. Not 2022, huh? 2023. 2023 yeah. yeah, 18 months here. I'll do the Napoleon Dynamite dance. 
to clear Anthony Sassano's debts to, debts to crypto Twitter. Crypto Twitter must agree to these terms. I wholeheartedly agree, sir. That's getting a retweet. <laughs> oh, I agree to these terms. I'm writing it down. This means you are doing this, David. <laughs> Uh, so, so, yeah, so like, uh, get ready, Anthony, Anthony has said that he's okay with this, like, but also like, it, it, this is a debt to crypto Twitter. So like, Anthony owes this to crypto Twitter. I'm saying I will pay back Anthony's debts, but crypto Twitter has to agree. I don't really know how to get consensus by crypto Twitter. So maybe you do what Ryan did and go to this tweet and say like, I agree to these terms, Dude, or I do not you agree to these terms. Consensus. Everyone wants this, David. All I've right, only heard of like three people that have said that they agree. Okay, what's the threshold for? Uh... Crypto Twittering, uh, Twitter agreeing to these terms, huh? 50 comments. 50 comments. 50 All comments right. saying, I agree. And it has to be like a 90 to 10 ratio of yes to no's. All right, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tweet this out. 50 comments. You heard it on the roll up. So <laughs> make sure we want to see David do this dance. We'll broadcast this on the roll up oh God. Uh, clip as well. All right. Takes it's, the it's a good thing that Ether's not going to hit an all time high by 2023. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's also the most bear market thing I've heard David say. Um, spicy Vitalik is mm -hmm. the best Vitalik. Mm -hmm. All right. What, what is he saying here? He's pushing back on the whole Ethereum is a security yeah. talk that was going around here. Um, I'll read his first tweet and then you read sure. a second. It's amazing how some proof of work pr proponents just keep repeating the unmitigated bare faced lie that proof of stake includes voting on protocol parameters. That's one of the arguments for why right. Ethereum should be a security. It's right. you can use ETH to it's vote and you actually it's can't. True. It's false. It doesn't, just like proof of work doesn't. And this so often just goes unchallenged. Nodes reject invalid blocks in proof of stake and in proof of work. It's not hard. And he follows this up because he is quote tweeting mm -hmm. someone who says, the fact that you can vote on something to change its properties is proof that it's a security. Love Bitcoin. Vitalik says, a, a small grammar nuance in English, when talking about things like proof of stake, we don't say it's a security. We say it's secure. I know these suffixes are hard to are hard though, so I forgive the air. Nice <laughs> that's, play. That's on the words uh, there. spicy take, which is saying like, "Hey, you Bitcoiners who think that Ether is a security because of proof of stake, no, it's extra secure." Unlike the proof of work hard cap model, which is destined to run out of security budget. Um, this was what I was going back earlier, where uh, like people think that like proof, people associate proof of stake with governance because like your stake determines the next block, but no, like your your thirty two Ether is an ASIC. What determines the rules and the update to the rules are people that download and update their nodes, just node like operators. in Bitcoin, is Running node operators. You do not need to stake to update your nodes or determine the future direction of the blockchain. Node operators do this. You don't have to have money. You don't have mm -hmm. to have any, well, all you have to do is be able to run a node on a right. machine and then you are essentially validating. Yes. Um, uh, so here's here's the last uh, take that, we, that, I'll, that we'll give. I think that's the last take. No, we got one more. Uh, this is me and I say, how to become a millionaire. This, this is it. This is going to work. Everyone who's listening to this, who follows this, can become a millionaire, hopefully. 50% chance. Uh, number one, stick around and pay attention during the bear market. Number two, that's it. That's all, <laughs> that's all you do. That's all you do. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the whole idea is that alpha is generated in the bear market. The people that stuck around during the, the 2018 to 2020 bear market... Like they got to participate in DeFi summer, which was like, I don't know about, about you, Ryan, but like DeFi summer was way more like lucrative than 2021. Like there was just like money being printed everywhere. It was super fun. Like the vibes were really good. Uh, and, and then also people who were participated in DeFi summer, they knew the bull market was on like a whole 12 months before like other people that had left during the bear market or people who didn't know about crypto. So like we knew the, bull, the 2021 bull market was going to happen in like, April of 2020. And so we had like six months, nine months to like front run everyone else. Yeah, totally. You got to stick around in order to do that. I have a third way to become a millionaire though, David. Listen to 10% inflation oh. for the next decade. <laughs> <laughs> everyone gets to be a millionaire. <laughs> like the US dollar is eroding that fast. <laughs> exactly. Nice. Um, all right. Uh, final take for you. This is a, a whole letter from Pinter. We can't read the letter mm -hmm. in this take, of course, but I think the synopsis is the title. DeFi worked great. All of CeFi was failing all around us. DeFi worked great. Dan from Pantera Capital pushes back against the idea that has become a narrative somehow that Celsius and BlockFi, right. all of these were like DeFi. Right. And here's a, an article he's pointing to. DeFi has an existential problem. No, DeFi worked incredibly well during this downturn. Uh, and he pushes back on all of that. So I'll, read, I'll, I'll leave that for your homework. Well, I asked David the question, we end these episodes with, what are you bullish on this week, my friend? Uh, 
Am, am I allowed to like leak some alpha? Uh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Give me yeah. the alpha. Is it is is it something I've heard? Uh, yeah. You know all about. I it. know about this. Yeah, okay. You know no, about the alpha. Leak yeah. away then. Yeah. For the for the first time ever, there is more being built at Bankless behind the scenes than than out in public. Like usually, almost everything we do is completely in public. Like ninety five percent of Bankless is out in public. It's just like the Discord and coordination, the five percent of coordination that's like in private. Uh, for the first time ever, there's like more stuff being built in private that we've got in secret than it was in public. I feel, I feel teased, sir. Yeah, do you feel teased? Are you teasing me? Yeah, I'm teasing. <laughs> You're teasing the Bankless is it, is it working? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know what's going on, so it's not working on me, but uh, yeah, that would pique my interest. Yeah. Yeah, when am I gonna find out more, David? Uh, well, there's, well, there's a number of different things. There's this one thing that is happening, and then there's this other thing that's happening. <laughs> oh my God, there's and then no there's detail. the third thing, <laughs> which is the Bankless Studio, uh, which most people know about, but they don't know to the degree of how awesome it's gonna be. So there's there. I teased one of the three things. There you go. Oh, uh-huh. We got some stuff coming, is yeah. what David's saying in the yeah. pipeline. Yeah. Ryan, what are you excited about? What are you uh, I'm excited about the universe, David. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean this literally this time. So you can't like uh, you know, talk about like my deep thoughts are, are, are weird. Yeah. The James Webb <laughs> Telescope. Okay. This has been a project that's been like over a decade long mm-hmm. and it launched last December. I've been following this. This is the only thing. I might be more excited about than the Ethereum merge. Okay, might be. Yeah. Probably not. I, I've got so, nutrition. So you've got in the deep space. <laughs> uh, deep freaking space, yes. Yeah. And the James Webb telescope. And so uh, you guys probably saw this. The pictures yeah. were all over the place. Pictures came back from the first pictures from the James Webb telescope, and they are absolutely phenomenal. Cool. Okay. What we're looking cool. at here is like some of these stars, David, mm-hmm. are just 500 million years old. Okay, we are looking back deeper oh, in space so than we ever have. That's like 95% through the timeline of the universe. Yeah. That's how far back we are looking here. And it just blows my mind. Uh, you know, there's there's tons of stuff you can find. Like, you know, r slash space is full of these images if you want to get super geeky. But I think I have a crypto take here too, which is it. like, <laughs> this is a 2022 thing that I think the world needed and I think we needed. Mm. Um, because first of all, what is the James Webb Telescope? Well, it's a public good. This is open source knowledge that we can now share across uh, the internet. And it's kind of like some of the things that we're building in crypto, and that's amazing in and of itself. It's also a massive engineering undertaking, right? Uh, that has taken over a decade. This project was far more complicated than anything humanity has ever launched into space. Just the level of, of detail and planning mm-hmm. and everything had to go right in order for the mirrors to unfold. It's just an incredible story. Uh, and that we were able to do this as a species is absolutely phenomenal. We have a giant eyeball apparatus in space now, and that's cool. Um, also, this is like science, scientific discovery. And as we know, it's like science, technology, that is the way we actually progress, right? The, these inflation cycles, these monetary policy things, that's not actually doing anything for progressing and improving uh, humanity and the quality of life for humans. Uh, in the short run, the way we improve quality of life is through technology. That's the thing that always works. And right. we need science in order to do that. Uh, and then this gives me like a new perspective. It gives people a new perspective on the universe. And it's a time where like, I mean, there's wars happening. There's conflict everywhere. No one can get along. And um, this is something that we coordinated on to launch into space. I don't know. It's just a breath of fresh air in the 2020s. And I feel like we really needed that. That's, that's my take on the telescope and why it's important. I love it. I love it. One, one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is that like, while there's like so much short-term bearishness and like because of like the recession that is about to happen to us and all of our assets are down bad, everyone's like focused on the next like one to two years. Like how do I make sure I get to one of these two years? And then there's like even greater stuff like that, like global geopolitical things are totally going to shift. The world's going to look super different in five years. The dollar's about to collapse. Like all of this short-term, short-term in the grand scheme of things, like bearish stuff that like, damn, we're going to have to like the whole fourth turning thing. Like there's this big world transition that we're about to go through. But on the other side of that, there's like this space race that's about to trigger. There's like this metaverse that's about to develop. There's like biohacking and gene editing that is like on the cusp of exploding. There are so many cool things ahead of us and like they're all positioned to be like the thing that pulls us out of this just like crazy, terrible, like global reshuffling that we're about to go through. Yeah, I totally agree. I I think, um, I mean, bullish humanity over the long run, Always, right? Um, Bullish humanity. Uh, Meme of the week, David, what are we looking at this week? Yeah, uh, this is uh, Mike3 at, at Enjoyor on Twitter. 
Uh, it says, Base Carbon, working on a dank playlist, and the playlist is titled Three, AC, three Arrows Capital, Three AC. <laughs> and it's song one, Can I Borrow a Dollar? Song two, I Need Some Money. <laughs> song three, Give Me Yo Money. <laughs> song four, Money, That's What I Want. Chuck Brown, song five, We Need Some Money. Uh, song six, Can I Borrow a Dollar? Again. Song seven, Spare Some Change. Uh, eight, Can I Borrow a Dollar? Nine, Can I Get Some Money? Uh, yeah, Three Arrows Capital, down bad. Oh, it keeps on going. It keeps on going. Yeah. I need money. Can I borrow a dollar? I need money again. I need money. Give me money, 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 money. Oops. Oops. That's it. That's, That's the Zero's Capital the playlist. If you're if you're into that kind of listening, then uh, we'll include a link where you can find that on uh, on Spotify. <laughs> Guys, as always, none of this has been financial advice. Crypto is risky. ETH is risky. So is Bitcoin. You could definitely lose what you put in. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone. But we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anything, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.